Uh, and again, we're going to concentrate on dairy cattle diets for this talk, as uh, contrasted with Andy's talk before on uh, on beef cattle. And if we look at the uh, ruminant species in dairy cattle, I guess in particular in terms of their nitrogen efficiency, which would be defined as the amount of product nitrogen that we get out relative to the amount of dietary nitrogen that they consume. And in, in this case, uh, feeding all these animals uh, to NRC requirements, you can see that the beef and dairy animals are not as efficient in converting nitrogen to product as the uh, monogastric animals are. And so the question we've had over quite a number of years is, are they poor converters because there's something intrinsically um, you know, intrinsic to those animals that prevents them from converting better, or are they just poor converters because we're not doing a very good job of feeding them? And of course, the uh, worries are that there's environmental uh, and environmental consequences for overfeeding this nitrogen or, or being a poor converter. And in particular, you know, we're interested today in the air quality issues. And so the picture on the right was taken in the uh, Central Valley of California around the Tulare area, which is where there's a high population of dairy cattle. And it's almost impossible to see, even though the uh, coastal range is in the background there behind the helicopter, only about 10 miles away, it's almost completely um, not, not able to see it because of all the particulates in the air. And of course, uh, there's a number of things that are, that are uh, contributing to that, but certainly one of the items is the dairy cattle or the high population of dairy cattle in that area. So if we want to try to understand how to make these animals more efficient so that they, they excrete less nitrogen and, and hopefully reduce the amount of ammonia that's being volatilized from that excreta, we need to understand a little bit more about how they work and, and then hopefully we can use that information to manipulate the diet of the animal. So in this case, we've, we've got a, a pictorial representation of the cow and, and how she processes her nitrogen. And the first stop in, in ruminants, of course, is their rumen, which is a, essentially a large microbial fermentation vat. And when we feed the animals protein, it enters that rumen first. And so we end up with feed protein in the rumen that can be either catabolized by the microbes that are in there and used to support their growth, or it can escape catabolism by those microbes and flow out to the small intestine where it's available for absorption. Now, of course, the microbes catabolizing this protein is not bad because they can use that then to support their own growth, and they eventually will flow out to the small intestine and provide a nitrogen source to the animal as well. But these microbes are sort of like uh, college students in, in that uh, if you send your college student off to college, uh, a certain amount of money is required when you send them off. Uh, to pay for tuition and to pay for living expenses. And if you don't send enough money, then it's a bad outcome because they come back home again. And uh, we'd like to see them stay in college and become productive uh, members of society and earn their own living. But if we give them too much money, then most of them, at least in my experience, aren't going to call home and tell you that you've uh, provided too much money and that they're going to send some back. Well, the microbes are the same way. If we provide them too much nitrogen, then they will catabolize that extra nitrogen. It'll be absorbed across the rumen wall and end up in the liver where it'll be converted to urea. And the outcome of that is sort of the same thing as providing too much money and ending up with a, a beer allowance or a larger beer allowance. And that essentially, when I look at my uh, uh, expenditures on college students that I have in school, uh, I view that as wasted money. And so the same case here, if we overfeed the microbes on protein and they convert it to urea, a lot of that's just going to be excreted as urea in the urine and be subject to volatilization. Now, the nice thing about the ruminants is there is the recycling, and I guess this is a bit like uh, recycling the aluminum cans, but uh, in the case of the beer example, but they can take some of that urea that's converted and bring that back into the rumen, and it can be used by the microbes again so we can recycle that nitrogen, and certainly we'd like to do that as much as possible. And, of course, the animal actually contributes to this as well because it will catabolize any excess nitrogen we give it as, as well. So the question is, can we feed these cows better to try to uh, reduce the amount of nitrogen that they, they excrete and uh, increase the amount of nitrogen that's uh, recycled and, and put into product? The other nice thing about dairy cows is they actually have conversion or, or excretion of urea into the milk. Uh, my milk can here got a little red. It should, be, should have been white. But um, at any rate, we'll end up with... Uh, urea that will end up in the milk, and it's a good 
sort of indicator of what's going on in the animal. High urea in milk means we've got a lot of waste nitrogen going out. Low urea means we've, we're running the animal very efficiently. So if we look at feeding these animals differently, uh, the NRC requirements currently call for about 10% of this ruminally degradable protein. And if I back up, I forgot to make sure and define that, but the ruminally degradable protein is that that's being catabolized by the microbes. The undegradable protein is the stuff that's passing through and ending up in the animal, uh, or at least available for the animal to absorb. So if we take the rumen degradable protein down from this 10% requirement, basically, that the NRC has set for that animal to 8.8% or 7.6%, you can see that the first step down in this particular example had no negative consequences on either dry matter intake or on milk yield. But when we went down the last step, then there was a, a significant reduction in dry matter intake and a fairly strong trend for reduction in milk yield. So if we fed these animals at 8.8% RDP instead of at 10%, we could certainly make the animal operate more efficiently and therefore excrete less nitrogen. And so if we look at these animals and calculate their efficiency, in this case, I took the milk nitrogen divided by the dietary nitrogen times 100, you can see that as we lowered the dietary protein or the RDP in the diet, they became more efficient, going from the average at requirements of about 25% to about 32% when we took it down to the lowest level. And the mercury nitrogen went in the opposite direction. So when the animals were very efficient, they had low mercury and nitrogen. When they were very inefficient, they had high mercury and nitrogen. So from a regulatory standpoint or a monitoring standpoint, we'd like to say, okay, well, where can we draw the line in the sand here on the mercury and nitrogen? If it's above a certain level, then we're overfeeding the animal. If we look at the um, uh, performance then on a subsequent study where we took the the high protein diet or the 11.3 percent RDP and compared it to the, the moderate level protein diet which didn't result in a loss in production or the 8.8 percent RDP. You can see that the dry matter intake on this second study was slightly reduced. We did not lose any milk production and the MUN levels in milk were down significantly. So the animal would appear to have become more efficient. If we then look at the excretion levels the amount of total Keldahl nitrogen or the nitrogen that ended up in the manure on the, on the pen floor was significantly reduced. The ammonia nitrogen that was in that uh, feces and urine on the pen floor was not significantly different. And surprisingly for us, even though we made the animal more efficient and ended up with less nitrogen on the floor, the ammonia emissions off of the pen floor were not significantly different. However, it became more clear than when we, when we Took the nitrogen or took the feces and urine and loaded it daily into um, storage tanks and looked at ammonia emissions off of those storage tanks over time. In the first week, there was actually uh, increased ammonia emissions from the storage tank. And again, these are preliminary data. But by the second week and for all subsequent weeks, the low, low nitrogen diets had significantly lower levels of ammonia being emitted off of those tanks. And you can see quite a bit of variation from week to week, and that reflects the amount of variation imposed by environmental temperatures. So the week three was probably much colder temperatures than week two was. So you can have a lot bigger effect of temperature uh, on terms of, of instantaneous rates of ammonia emissions than you can of dietary uh, treatments. So if we come back to the animal now and, and forget about the microbes for a minute and think about the the uh, waste nitrogen that potentially can occur within the animal itself from this absorbed nitrogen that's being contributed by the diet and by the microbes and see whether there's anything we can do there. And in this case, we'd refer to this as metabolizable protein, which is the rumen undegradable protein plus the microbial protein. So if we reduce the amount of nitrogen that's available to the animal, can she become more efficient? And so in this particular study, if we start at the right-hand side and look at the low protein, which is a 14.4% crude protein diet and a low energy diet, 1.44 megacals per kilogram, and these are based on NRC 2001 calculations, we have low or have a, a milk production level of slightly more than 25 kilograms a day. If we increase the protein in the diet up to 17%, which is roughly the normal protein level for, for dairy cows, we get a significant response in milk yield. So 
by theory, we would say that if we, if we took the low energy and low protein diet and added energy to it, we shouldn't see any response because the cows were clearly deficient in protein. But in fact, when we added energy to the diet, but no extra protein, they did in fact re respond. And not only did they respond, they responded more than they did if we just provided protein. And of course, if we take the high energy, high protein diet, that's the normal for, for the uh, feeding these cows. We did get slightly more production as compared to the, the high energy, low protein diet. You can see that the mercury and nitrogen are, is moving around where we have high energy, low protein diets, or when we have low protein diets, we have low MUN. And when we have high protein diets, we have high MUN, indicating the animal was not being as efficient. And so if we look at those efficiencies, again, calculated as uh, nitrogen input to the animal, in this case, as compared to nitrogen output in, in milk yield, we can see that the animals were more efficient when we fed them low protein diets, whether they had high energy or low energy, and that was reflected by low MUN levels. So we can actually take these animals and make them more efficient by taking protein out of the diet, and it works better if we keep the energy level up in the diet. We did lose milk yield, so it's not necessarily an economically favorable outcome, but if uh, we're end ending up with a situation where we have to reduce uh, environmental loading, then we can actually do that. So in summary, we can improve the nitrogen efficiency of dairy cows, and I think we're you know, in, in a position today where we can do that by reducing the amount of ruminally degradable protein that's in the diet and, and reducing that below NRC requirements. And it doesn't appear like, you know, at least for, for a, a short distance, we, can, we will experience any losses in productivity by doing that. I think longer term, we can reduce the rumen undegradable protein or reduce the amount of protein that's available to the animal itself and will improve the efficiency of the animal. But at least today, with what we know, we're going to lose some production doing that. And so there is going to be some economic costs associated with that. As far as the rumen degradable protein, uh, one of the unfortunate things, I guess, today is that with all the ethanol byproducts that are available in the marketplace, protein has become relatively less expensive as compared to 10 or 12 years ago. And so at least when we looked at those diets where we reduced the RDP to those cows, it, it wasn't uh, uh, an economically favorable um, situation. In other words, it, re it increased the feed cost to that cow, even though we took the protein level of the diet down. Now, it has saved money in the past when you've done this. So if you look back 10 years ago when we did those kind of diets, they actually saved money. So we can't for certain say that it won't save money again in the future. But today, given the current uh, marketplace, it doesn't save money. And then finally, you know, the reduced dietary nitrogen leads to reduced manure nitrogen and ammonia emissions, which is, you know, very good. And from our observations, there was very little nitrogen that was really lost from the barn floor. Most of the ammonia emissions from, from the facilities in, in total were actually coming from the storage facilities. And there are huge temperature effects in that. So the, the losses are very low in the winter, and they're going to be much higher in the summer, just as Andy was showing for the feedlot data. So with that, I appreciate your time, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mark. I uh, really appreciate that. The uh, cow is uh, quite a complex animal that uh, does a lot of different things. Uh, again, again, quick reminder about uh, questions in the chat box. This is a good time to uh, get those in there, and we'll uh, have our speakers uh, address those when we get to the end. Our uh, next presentation will also... Uh,